it's a kind of what you might call a visual code recognition technology, which that, that sounds a bit posh, doesn't it? But it really means you point a camera at some image and the computer recognises something about the image and it can trigger some information. And if that still doesn't make sense, then um, you actually will be really familiar with these things because they've been around since the 1950s. Here is the barcode, which you'll find on all sorts of products in the supermarket and at home. Turn over anything that has a barcode. And this encodes information, a series of numbers, in this case into thinner or thicker lines, point a camera or camera-like device at it, uh, and, and it triggers some information. Um, here's another kind of code that you're probably familiar with, which is the QR code, which is an evolution of the barcode to encode things like whole web addresses uniquely, so you can go from some kind of poster on a wall to actually kind of visit a website by pointing your phone at it. They've got a really interesting property, and then when you look at them visually, you're pretty aware what they are. You can see immediately that's a barcode, and you can see immediately that's a QR code, and that's kind of good, you know what it is and you know where to point your camera and you know what you're looking for and that makes things good. But in other circumstances it's not so good because they are, well how can I put it, they are pig ugly really aren't they, let's be clear. So there have been various attempts by companies to kind of improve the visual appeal and you can actually see them a bit here. There are some really clever designers who are taking things like barcodes and adding extra bits of logo to at least kind of prettify them or, or do various other bits. If you did that really cleverly you might want to use one on your product a bit more visibly. Um, but there's no getting away from it that at the end of the day, unless you want the world around you plastered with barcodes and QR codes, um, the aesthetic of these limits some of the situations in which you'd want to use them. So we were kind of interested in uh, how could we create visual markers like these, but, but that had a kind of a, a nicer aesthetic. And also how could we give you creative control over actually making that aesthetic in the first place. And we picked on a piece of work that was um, done by a guy called Enrico Costanza uh, while he was at ETH in Zurich and he came up with this um, idea of using the topology of the image as the way of encoding information. So what does that mean? That means that I need to draw uh, a certain number of regions that contain a certain number of blobs within them and if I get that, that number right then the shape of them doesn't actually matter. So let me have a go. Uh, this could be interesting. I'm afraid I'm not a great visual artist, as you're about to see. So this is me drawing, so what am I drawing here? I'm drawing, topologically, five regions that are all connected together. There you can see them. And I'm now going to put some solid, and the rule of the game is these things have to be solid. That one's a dot, and that one's a line, and that one's a cross, and another couple of dots, because I'm so boring I can't think of anything else to put. So I've now created a pretty simple topological shape. It consists of five regions. Each region contains a certain number of dots, uh, and in this case, there is one, 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 two. That could be the code. One, 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 two. Maybe. Let's have a go. I now have my Aesthetic Codes app running on my mobile phone here. So um, I'm going to just have a bit of a scan of this. And lo and behold, that uh, red marker says it's found what it is, and it's now eventually um, going to kind of take me to well, whatever I want it to go to. In this case, I've programmed it to go to a website, which happens to advertise aesthetic codes, of course, but you know, you know that you could program it to, to point at pretty much anything you want. Because it's, it's only concerned with the number of regions and the number of things within those regions, the key thing to remember is that the shape doesn't matter. So let me have a, another pop at this. Hmm. So that looks suspiciously like it's the same code. Oh, there we go, we've got it again. And it's gonna to take to the same website. The order in which these appear, it doesn't matter at all yet. It's just the number of regions, the number of sub-bits they contain. The thing that we did, if you like, to move this on was that we got it out of the hands of uh, computer scientists like myself who don't draw particularly well, into the hands of people whose, you know, whose skill it is to draw beautiful patterns. So we took it to designers and we started to teach them how to use it to see what they would come up with. And that's where things got really interesting. So. Um, we worked with some folks at Central St Martin's College in the ceramic design department and we gave them some training and we said, come back to us with some patterns and here's what they created. We gave each designer three codes. So that's code one, that's code two, and that's code three embedded within a pattern. What's happening here is that the code is actually appearing several times within this pattern and that makes it more robust in computer science terms. That's redundancy built in and we'll come to why that's really important in, in just a moment. So this is the same designer 
who's created three different patterns with the codes in. So this is the same information, and this is what's so beautiful about this technique. You can kind of create these different designs that embody the same information, or very similar looking designs can embody different information. And it's all down to the skill of the designer and how clever they are at hiding these codes within the images as to which of those effects they might want to create. So it becomes a really playful and creative kind of way of thinking about design. And, you know, we can flick through a few more. There's some lovely designs here. You can see so this is Annabelle Dee's designs. She's gone for a range of styles, from the kind of literal to the abstract, uh, and so on. And, uh, the penguins, which are proved uh, from Nicole, extremely popular. So we have this kind of pattern book of designs. I guess the interesting question you might ask, well, you know, kind of what is it for, I suppose? Why, why would you want to do this? And what we're interested in is opening up a conversation about how we might decorate the world around us with interesting interactive surfaces and what you might start to do with those. And this is an exploratory process. So to kick it off, we um, were fortunate enough to work with a restaurant chain called Busaba, based in London. And they're a kind of Thai restaurant they take a great deal of time to kind of, if you like, source their recipes and do kind of field research and, and they kind of put them together uh, really carefully. So there's a lot of background and history to the, the recipes. And they also tend to kind of serve them in almost individual dishes. So we worked with Bisaba to start to, cre to create a series of restaurant objects that might tell you stories. So we put some of the patterns you've just seen onto plates. This brings us back to the earlier mention I made of redundancy. So one of the reasons we wanted redundancy in the patterns is because uh, if you take a close look at this plate you'll notice there's lots of specular reflections on, that are happening here uh, and these specular reflections are highly visible to the camera when you point it at that. So these will actually blot out wherever they happen. I'm finding that. <laughs> so they're actually going to blot out the pattern. So in order to avoid this kind of things, you really need to decorate the object with multiple versions of the code. And of course, plates get dirty or fabrics get covered or marked or scuffed or whatever. So redundancy, which of course yeah, is a well-known concept in computer science, comes back in a, another, another way here. So Basaba worked with us and we kind of uh, imagined a number of uses for these. We had plates that, for example, would give you the particular recipe that went with them. So you'd point your phone at the plate, maybe you'd even take the plate home as a souvenir or buy it, and then in your kitchen you could get the latest Busaba recipe. Placemats. So when you go into the restaurant, you get your placemat setting, and this might give you information about uh, your particular order. So um, you know, where, where was it in the process? At one point we even you know, played with the idea of a video view into the kitchen to see your actual food being kind of cooked. A sort of menu, and this might give you the dish of the day if you looked at that, because that dynamically changes every day. So the idea was, yeah, you'd have the standard menu items inside, pointing at the aesthetic code would, would kind of give you the current dish of the day. And you know, all this is a kind of very open conversation. So we're kind of currently thinking about uh, yeah, other future applications of this. I think one of the most exciting things for me is to scale it up to much bigger surfaces. So what I'm really interested in is things like interactive wallpapers, uh, interactive kind of furniture patterns, or possibly clothing, where you've got multiple codes in a big area, perhaps different codes that as you look at it in different ways kind of tell you a, a story or, or make it kind of more interactive. I mean, one of the big open questions at the moment is, is one about... Um, human-computer interaction is that how will people interact with these things um, because you know as we said earlier the great thing about these codes is you can see where they are and you know where to point your phone the more you hide the codes within wider patterns the harder it becomes for the, the end user to actually know how they're meant to interact so that's a kind of key problem to solve or if they can at all well, yeah or whether a surface is interactive now, people wandering around with their phones. yeah just trying to figure out well is that a standard texture or is that something I can interact with? So there's quite a big interaction design challenge there. Now I think there are various ways around it. Um, I mean a simple one is you can just put more or less cues on the phone. You can put uh, you can put the outline shape of the penguins on the app and that says you're looking for these and wherever you see things like penguins or whatever then that might be an interactive code. Or perhaps you can more subtly kind of communicate it in the design itself, but in a way that doesn't destroy the aesthetic. And with any technique, there are some kind of limitations as well. Um, so at the moment, uh, we're fairly limited to the size of the code space, although in theory you could have an arbitrary number of regions and lots and lots of blobs within those regions. It soon gets 
quite unreliable for a, a standard mobile phone camera to be able to kind of tell exactly where the lines join up. So in practice, we're probably working at the moment with a code space of just a few hundred codes that you could distinguish, perhaps even at best, although you know the research is looking to push that further and further. But you really have to contrast it with things like the barcode and the QR code, which you know for their, if you like, simplicity of design are really well engineered to be scalable and robust. So I guess, as with so many things you know, in computer science, there's a kind of series of trade-offs at play. It's not to say, well, this is the right way for the whole world to be and this is the wrong way. Uh, QR codes and barcodes are scalable, robust. You know what they are the minute you see them. You know when and how to interact. These aesthetic codes, as we would call them, are creative and funky. You can make them yourself. They can be beautiful, but they pose a bunch of questions about how do you know where they are. And at the moment, we're challenged with how do you make them scalable and you know what happens when different codes map to the same information rather than a, a unique thing. So important, as always, to see it as a kind of a design space of trade-offs more than as one thing being right and the other wrong. We've released the app, if you like, as something that you can test out and play with for yourself. So um, just as I did, once you've kind of read through the website, you may work out what the rules are. And at that point, you can start to kind of create your own designs and test them out. And we're keen to hear from anyone who has a go at that. The order in which the kind of the regions, if you like, are found, that doesn't matter. But if you have different codes within a bigger pattern, that might matter, the order in which you're expected to search them out.